Uh, now it's uh, my pleasure to welcome, sorry, um, Professor Dawn Freshwater. Dawn's the Senior Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Registrar at the University of Western Australia and um, she is going to present on Leading Through Collaboration, Improving Self-Management Through Practitioner-to-Practitioner -practitioner Relationships. So please welcome um, Dawn. So thank you, and thank you to the organising committee for inviting me over from Western Australia. And um, also, can I say congratulations to you all Congratulations to you all for getting here and for making the time to be here. And that might sound like a very trite comment, but actually the reality is making time to be at events like this and um, to do what I think, uh, some of what Rosemary was talking about first thing this morning, strum your heartstrings as you sit here in the audience today reminding yourself of what's really important in terms of our roles. It is no mean feat these days, so congratulations to everybody for making the time. And it's two years since I sat with um, Kim in Fremantle when she was actually conceptualizing uh, today's event, so it's great that we're all able to be here. And the other Kim, <laughs> the other Kim just ended the presentation that, that Fantastic presentation, thank you, Kim. Uh, on the on focusing on you, really on focusing on health professionals, and that's where I want to pick up. So, um, whilst we've had really important presentations this morning, in fact, excellent commentary, Deborah signalled the national precipice that we have of chronic disease at the moment, with uh, particularly for me, interesting on the co-occurring uh, mental health problems. And she also signaled the collaborations that we are have demanded of us across the sector. That's not easy. And I think uh, we just need to pause for a moment as we move in towards lunch and, and remind ourselves that there's a taken for granted assumption that collaboration is easy, that collaboration is wanted, that collaboration is something that we all are happy to engage in and that actually it's a thing that we can measure to go back to Kim's point. Now there's a lot of literature around collaboration, some of my own which contests the notion of collaboration and um, the move towards it and the recognition that actually uh, we often know uh, collaboration by looking at failure to collaborate as a concept that's when we understand what collaboration truly is. So I just want to remind us that we're talking about something as if it is a given that we're all engaged in and happy to be engaged in. And just to turn to the title of this slide, I've, I want to remind us why we're here. The subtitle of today's um, conference is Integrated Care is Every Nurse's Business. Well, we could also ask a question about integrated care. Is it something that we really, truly understand? Are we able to measure it? And I would actually premise the presentation that I'm about to give with the notion that integrated care requires integrated teams. And integrated teams requires integrated people. And I'd be interested to know how many people in this audience feel integrated at the moment. And that's why I love this um, uh, particular image, actually, of, uh, of this sort of uh, machine consciousness that we're engaged in. We're more often into feeling more integrated with our iPhones and with the computers and with our iPads than we are with other people. And so um, I'm starting really by asking us just to take a moment to remind ourselves, be embodied, and understand what it is that's motivating us to be here today in terms of integrated care, your business, and how you're going to take that forward in your leadership roles. You're all leaders, whether or not that's something that you're aware of in a daily basis, you're all engaged in leadership. Um, Raymond focused a little bit on seamless services, and we talk about that again as if it's something easy. It there, it's there in the fabric of what we do. I would challenge that. And Leanne's slide 
was a great header for me because on her building blocks, the first building block she had up was a block that said engaged leadership was the first block to everything. So again, we come back to this notion of leadership, but actually engage leadership and thinking about that in the context of integration and collaboration. So that's where I'd like to just spend and dwell with you a little bit of time before we go into the lunch break. Uh, this in the context of organizational culture. So you will have seen in the, in the um, information that's been shared with you as part of the conference today, uh, that I've also focused a little bit on this chronic disease uh, global concern, the precipice that we've been talking about this morning, but in the context of self-management. And self-management of chronic illness is a particular key policy driver for, uh, it's nationally a policy driver, but it is internationally also. And I would argue that successful self-management requires holistic practices and seamless services. And it's a long, for me, it feels like we're a long way from holism at the moment. And I've been a nurse for 35 years, a practice nurse, a therapist. I've worked with Diana nurses in seamless services 20 years ago. I've worked in forensic mental health, and I've recently been working in correctional services. And I still feel a long way from holism. And these, these areas that I'm working in, and certainly as an academic, I'm still studying some of these areas, focus heavily on integrated care pathways, integrated teams, and inclusive leadership models, which I believe are fundamental to the discussion we're having today. But actually, in my experience, and as I witness the practice in these institutions and organizations, they are still struggling to really understand how to deliver these concepts that we're reaching after, um, critically reaching after in today's climate. So I want to just return to um, some high level concepts and really recognizing all the excellent work that's being done in clinical practice in the presentations that we've heard so far today. But let's just lift our heads up from the page for a moment and think about what we do and think about caring and the many mass of care, and there are many mass of caring in this room today. We've got representatives from primary care, mental health, diabetes care, we've got a psychiatrist, we've got people from the private sector. There are many mass of caring here today. Um, and all of you are engaged in caring at some level. And so it's interesting for me, if I, if I talk about the human mode of being, and this goes back to Simone Roche's work some time ago now, 2002, it's been developed by many caring theorists since then. But if I were to ask all of you in the room, from your own perspective and your own mask of caring, which one of these human modes of being, as espoused by Simone Roche, do, does not apply to your discipline? Which one would you sling off from your own discipline's point of view and say, no, that's not something I'm engaged in, in terms of caring? I would contend that they are common to all of us in this room. The way in which we compose ourselves in our day-to-day -day practices. So the way we carry ourselves as professionals. These, for me, are commonalities across everything that we do. This is actually a fundamental notion for me in terms of how we think about caring and collaboration. These are areas where we collaborate whether or not they're conscious. We're all engaged in these sorts of activities. We don't necessarily talk about them. They're fundamental to everything that we do. So we have commonalities. They're also common to thinking about the way in which we lead others as well as the way in which we relate to ourselves and relate to our colleagues. Now, interestingly, in some of the studies that I've been engaged in over the last 20 years, I find that health professionals are more interested in the way in which they enact these human modes of being and caring with their patients and with carers and consumers than they are with each other. I'm sure you don't have that experience. So it's really important, I think, to think about the way in which we relate to each other and how that impacts 
the enactment of integrated care and helps us in the collaborative pursuit that we've been talking about and then in thinking about some of the delivery, um, the service delivery models that we've been listening to this morning. And I want to just um, do a little detour if you'll bear with me on this because um, really what I'm talking about here is leadership, self-management, and that in the context of patient care, but actually leading yourself and managing, managing yourself also. And a lot of the recent trends in leadership and management are recognizing that compassionate and resonant leadership is contingent on a sense of professional responsibility and that which extends beyond technical compliance. So this is not professional responsibility in regard to meeting the technical aspects of your role and your technical competence. This is leadership that's actually fundamentally based on compassionate and resonant uh, professional responsibilities, which goes back to the human mode of being. So I would like us to consider for a moment one of the um, strong feminist understanding of fostering leadership, which is uh, by Rosalind Boloff. And um, the argument that she holds, which is that dominant organizational understandings of rationality, the way in which we manage ourselves currently, need to be extended in ways that acknowledge compassion, hope, and mindfulness, and the ways in which these are enacted within our relationships with each other. Well, this requires a degree of authentic emotional engagement with each other. And that's the sort of relationship that's typically enacted in the private sphere. So we're happy to do that in our private relationships, but not necessarily in our public relationships with each other as we work through our daily practices. So you might just want to ask yourself as you're sitting here reflecting on this, when, when and how have you been engaged compassionately, hopefully and mindfully with your colleagues in the way in which you're leading and, and demonstrating collaboration and integration yourselves. This is a type of per personalized ethics, I would argue. And I think it's particularly important, uh, given that we're now working really very much in the context of techn technolized, technologized leadership, which is this machine consciousness. So um, the, the idea that actually what we're doing is leading from techn technological expertise in our professional de decision making these days. <clears throat> Some might argue that we have cyborgic desires. You would think that um, actually when you lose your iPhone or when your computer crashes or if your PowerPoint presentation isn't working or something like that, that the world has ended. Uh, it really is recognizing that this is an extension of yourself. It's an extension somewhat of our cyborgic desires. And to bring ourselves back to thinking about leadership as a human enterprise and how important this is in our relationships to each other, to our patients, to the consumers, and to the carers that we're working with. How many times do you walk into a GP surgery or an environment within which you're engaged, in, even in your own healthcare exchange, for your own uh, maintenance of your own health, and find that the person that you're talking to and working with isn't looking at you, they're looking at the screen. So the argument here is that in an age of algorithmic thinking, and that's with apologies to all of those people that really use algorithms on a daily basis because they're also important, we need to consider what model of leadership we would want to demonstrate, which indicates a sociability of care. Care for ideas, care for imagination, care for personalized ethics, care for curiosity, and one that's based on dialogue and critical evaluation, and dialogue with each other, and dialogue in an integrative way, and one that is fostering and focused on collaboration. The algorithmic thinking that we're currently engaged in, many of us, and machine consciousness, presents a significant challenge to inclusive leadership, and therefore, I believe, collaboration. 
Machines often produce things that may all look the same. Um, algorithms produce similar outcomes. And that's important. It's part of what we need to do is in look, looking at randomized controlled trials and the generation of, of generalizability. But viewed from within this particular lens that I'm presenting around the relationships with each other and integration of our social aspects, our personal aspects, our leadership aspects in order to be collaborative, it actually means that we have to think about uh, machine consciousness in a different way. In fact, I would argue it leads to somewhat a disembodied approach to the way in which we're managing and leading ourselves and helping our patients to self-manage. What am I really saying here? If I was to summarize that, I were to say, and this includes me, leaders are so focused on doing the right thing at the moment that they're at doing absolutely nothing right. They're focused on the rational, the mechanics of the business, the planning cycles, making sure that they get the data turned out, making sure that they're dealing, spewing out information which is about controlling resources, most of which are people, by the way. Um, and in this context, a good leader is seen as someone who is astutely manipulating resources. Well, that's you. You know, you're one of those resources that's being astutely manipulated at the moment. We all are. And that's how we're, uh, that's how we're um, measuring effective leadership at the moment. Um, I, I'm proposing something else here. I'm proposing that these dueling missions that we have, and we do have dueling missions at the moment, in universities, my home territory at the moment, we have dueling missions of being a social enterprise as well as having sustainable business models. You have dueling missions in all of your everyday practice of delivering uh, the type of care that you re that really brought you into your profession all those years ago, and maybe not so many years ago, the type of care that you would like to deliver within an environment which has a scarcity of resources uh, that you're within which you're time poor, and within which um, the the emphasis on collaboration, ironically, which should make life easier for you and the patient, seems to be a burden. So those dueling missions can lead to internal cognitive dissonance, to conflict in the ways in which we experience ourselves, manage ourselves or not, and in doing so manage our patients and their care or not. Dueling missions can lead to either or positions and they can lead to us feeling somewhat disconnected and disassociated and the argument really that I'm putting forward today in a very em embodied way is that collaboration and integrated care at heart is really about a dialogical approach. It's, it is about an integrated approach and a dialogue between these dueling missions. Of course, we have to have sustainable business models, but actually not at the risk of losing the social enterprise and the importance of what we're doing. I'm quickly going to move through these slides because I want to get to this concept of dialogue. But if you're interested in knowing more about this approach to leadership and this approach to um, looking at managed care and self-management, some of the work that has been done in this uh, space has been published quite recently by myself and a colleague, Pamela Fisher, where we've been looking at compassionate care through a completely different lens that is really focusing more on the social enterprise and the sociability of care than the business model, but recognizes the sustainable business model as being important. It's um, related to aesthetic rationality, and it has looked at um, individuals within organizations and what's really motivating them. Uh, and and um, as I say, I won't go into detail, but it's focused on this sociability of care, which is formed in relationship and generated from domestic and community relationships. And I'm very much correlating uh, collaboration and integrated care with community relations. So to dialogue, for a, just to ponder on this for a moment or two, 
Um, if we think about dialogue, dialogue is something about common participation in which we are not playing a game against each other. Well, I'm sorry to say that in a room, through of room full of professionals who think that they collaborate with each other. But let's just hold the mirror up. We're not playing a game against each other. The object of the dialogue is not to analyze or to win an argument or even to exchange opinions when we talk about collaboration. Rather, it is to suspend your opinions and to look at the opinions too and listen to those of others. And then in that process, for all of us to suspend all of those opinions and to see what they all mean then I think we start to touch on something that might even get near integration. The Russian thinker Bakhtin coined this term dialogue and dialogism in the knowledge that um, all of our experiences are formed through words and through language and through dialogue. And he noted, as did actually David Bowen when he talked about dialogue, that this isn't a two-sided conversation dialogue, nor is it even a one-sided conversation. It literally means through language. It's through language that meaning emerges. Language, in other words, is not mine, it's not yours, it's not ours. It belongs to and it comes from and returns to the human community of which I'm a part of you're a part of, and which we all participate in through language. Now, this has profound implications for what it means to be a person, but it also has profound implications for what it means to be a health professional and one who espouses collaboration. It reminds us that the process by which ourselves are constituted is never finished, that dialogues are not something we can simply enter and leave, and that life is dialogic. We can't just assume that we're going to reach the point of integration or collaboration. We are somewhat in the journey towards that, and we need to keep reminding ourselves that. So how do we connect all of that with leadership and connect the culture within which we work with leadership, which is really part of what we need to think about in, uh, I think, leaving the event today. Well, in the macro-cultural climate that you're all engaged in, there are a number of explicit signals that actually we value integration, we value collaboration, we value um, all of those human modes of being that I've signaled earlier. So we talk about through strategies and missions, you'll find it in your mission statement, you'll find it in your code of conduct, you'll find it in many documents that relate to your practice, that diversity of thinking, diversity of views is welcomed, that um, there is transparent reward and recognition systems for hierarchies within those, uh, in those mission statements that value leadership, help people to move through leadership, recognize legitimate authority, that are value-based, and that are focusing on the importance of engagement and dialogue. What actually happens in the microclimate, that's the macroclimate, what actually happens in the microclimate is there are hidden hierarchies. There's hidden hierarchies in this room right now. Whether you like it or not, there is. In congruence with values, that's what's happening actually in practice. We found that there's op we find there's opaque da power dynamics and that there's all sorts of organizational contexts within which you work that prohibit the movement towards integrated care and actually work against collaboration. Some of that is legacy, it's what you've worked, come into, and some of that is part of the transformational agenda. The model that I'm going to leave you with, and is um, that I'm just about to finish, so don't panic, we're there. Um, and, and I know you want your lunch. Uh, the model that I'm going to leave you with is a published paper. It's two published papers, and it's based on a, a piece of research around inclusive leadership across 85 institutions. And it's, it was really looking at what was happening 
in the fabric of the institution, not what was specified in the mission statement and what was there in terms of the um, aims and goals. And um, where, the, where the institutions and the staff felt culturally connected to what they were doing and integrated from an organizational point of view and in a team-based approach which lent itself to improve care, the values base was absolutely explicit, adhered to, understood, and driven. People worked with humility, learning from each other, vulnerability was welcomed, and immediacy, dealing with things in the moment, not waiting till you've left the room and then acting out, which we complain all the time about our patients doing. Um, and open and learning and inclusive. Actually, things that we say we want in patient care in terms of enactment, enactment of what we do in our profession, very difficult to find in our own teams. There's a strategic imperative then for inclusion um, and inclusive leaders in organizations, which I'm not going to go into, but developing inclusive leaders, leadership strategy is not easy. It requires recruitment for diversity of thinking and diversity of solutions. That isn't always easy. And it actually focuses on a diversity of values-led grounded decision-making processes. So that's where I'm going to leave you. And I'm happy to answer any questions and to follow up with anybody through the lunch break. I'm really an opportunity, I think, to take the content of today's meeting and of course take it back into practice, but reminding ourselves that we also have to trouble the taken for granted assumption that we know what integrated care is, that we can go and deliver it, and that we are all committed to collaboration. Because the reality is that when we start to unpick our unconscious biases, they may tell us something else. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dawn. Um, we'll just see if you... Yes. I just have one question. I'm Cara, and I'm from Western Australia. I don't know you, but I'm going to <laughs> get to know you. Um, my question is um, about whether we can work on any of this if we don't first identify who owns the health transaction. It's not the consumer. Mm -hmm. It's also not the service provider. There is some other entity, disembodied, whatever, who owns the transaction. And until ownership comes to the consumer and the health provider, we're not the people in, you know, that can work on yep. the collaboration. Yep. It's a great question and great to meet somebody else here from Western Australia as well. So. Um, I want to go back to a question that came up and the response to that question um, at the pre with Kim's presentation. And it was about the system uh, and, the, and what the system does to people. Well, whether we like it or not, we are the system. So we might not feel that, and there's a lot that we feel that we're fighting against in the system, but we are also the system. So we are also that system that people feel really frustrated about. You know, I feel frustrated every time I ring Telstra because I have that same sort of experience that people are having when they try to get their Medicare sorted out, et cetera, et cetera. But believe it or not, people feel like that about us in this room. We are also the systems. It's very easy to look out there and see it happening out there and to be on the receiving end of it and not to ask ourselves the question. So um, being part of the system means that we have to take some responsibility in leading how that health transaction is understood and owned. So whilst I, we can go right back to the beginning of the day and the earlier presentations around the chronic um, disease precipice and saying that self-management is something that government is really wants to get, get behind. Actually, if you look at the policies, it makes it very difficult to do that. So, so what does that mean? It means that <clears throat> many of us in this room will think that we're policy implementers. We're also policy generators. And that's, that's a call to action. A very, very difficult call to action. But we can do it. And we are capable of doing it. And guess what? We generate policy all the time. 
It's implicit in what we're doing. So we're going to have to think about these. These are big questions. We have to think about them. Who owns the health transaction and who? what is the system within which that happens? And given that we're part of it, I think we're, for me, we're back to thinking about how we lead through that. And, and we each have a responsibility, but if we were integrated, and back to the where I started from, if we were integrated and truly able to collaborate on some of these issues, we would certainly be a force to be reckoned with in terms of really establishing who owns the health transaction and informing policy. Uh, it's not, there's no, I don't think there's a simple answer, but, but I think we have to be responsible for that. It's a question, Joe. Uh, yes, uh, Adam Johnson, health uh, consumer. Uh, I want to go back to your point on on dual emissions because not only am I a consumer, but I sit on several committees for my local health district. Uh, and what what I notice is that uh, whether you're a consumer or whatever capacity you're sitting in, you can propose any number of programs or ideas. But the thing you have to come along with, for it to be credible, is your business case. So, so we can't deny the resources or the financial imperatives um, if we want to change anything. So how do you actually resolve uh, that, that duality? Because, I mean, I'd say that the health transaction is owned by the taxpayer, largely by the government. And ultimately, we have to justify every dollar we spend. So again, how do we mm -hmm. resolve uh, the dueling ideas of health and and wellness? Thank you, thank you. So it's a really interesting point to reflect on. There's several things I'd like to say in response to that. Quite a lot of people here today in this room are attempting to resolve the issue of dueling missions in terms of health. <clears throat> so it's whether it's physical health, mental health, what are co-occurring co co um, comorbidities. So we're actually there is something that people are trying to do around that. Uh, and that that's it's an important dynamic in terms of bringing people together and bringing what are seeming polarities together in a unified way. So there's a fantastic new model that's just come out of Harvard, which is looking at hybridization and the hybrid institution and organizational model, which brings together social enterprise and the business and the sustainable business model. And it's based on this, um, on the fact that there has been dueling missions, but we need to move beyond dueling missions. So it's very easy to get into polarities. And in fact, what we need to do is to start to think, as I've said, Rather than get into, well, this is my opinion and this is your opinion and compare the two and somebody comes off better or worse, actually you need to bring a multiplicity of views to the table and then look at them all with a critical gaze. And that's often when the third starts to arise so that you get something that actually brings together a multiple set of views and gives you something different. The integration of business case with social enterprise, I think, and you may contest this, is a skill that health professionals are particularly able to adapt to and, to and become skilled at. And I say that because I'm a nurse, I'm a senior deputy vice chancellor in a, in, a, in a GO8 university. I have to look at making sure that every day I lead from the position that I've been talking about, which is values led, at the same time as quantify that values-led leadership in a way that is brings to the table sustainable business model that will have dollars attached to it. So I, I actually think this is about not about the business case and it's not about the social enterprise, it's about the people bringing those things together in a way that actually recognizes both the quality and the quantity that's on the table. So not privileging the algorithm, not actually privileging the, 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 you know, the, the sort of social enterprise, valuing both. That's what integrated care is actually about also.